everything that happens, whether it's comfortable, uncomfortable, good experience, bad experience, ultimately there's something there leading us toward being the better version of ourselves. So what is there to learn? And I, I stopped resenting some of the experiences and actually became grateful for how much I learned and how much I was able to grow. And I don't think it really gets more abundant than that. You're listening to the Mindful Mama podcast episode 146. Today we're talking to Allie Katz about five ways to find your zen in just a minute. Welcome to the Mindful Mama podcast. Here it's about becoming a less irritable, more joyful parent. At Mindful Mama, we know that you cannot give what you do not have. And when you have calm and peace within, then you can give it to your children. I'm your host, Hunter Clark Fields, Mindful Mama Mentor. I coach overstressed moms on how to cultivate calm in their daily lives and to create more peace and cooperation in their families. I've been practicing mindfulness for over 20 years. I'm the creator of the Mindful Parenting Course, and I'm the author of the upcoming new book, Raising Good Humans, a mindful guide to breaking the cycle of reactive parenting and raising kind, confident kids. Welcome. I hope that your day is going well. I'm so glad you are here today. This is going to be a fabulous podcast for you to listen to. In just a moment, I'm going to be sitting down with Allie Katz, and that is her real name, which you'll hear. (laughs) But we're going to be talking about how, about the toxic effects of stress and how it can affect our relationships, our parenting, about her story from feeling really stressed, being kind of a hot mess, really a mommy martyr, and then turning that around to become a meditation teacher and an author. And she is going to teach us five easy ways to recover from stress quickly in order to live a more mindful, joyful life. So it really is. It's possible. It's possible to recalibrate, achieve balance, and really become more mindful without taking a lot of time in your day. So some of the things I'm really excited about are those five really easy practices that you're going to hear. And as she talks about how even a One minute of meditation a day really activates the parasympathetic, that rest and relax nervous system. And she talks to us about exactly what to say to explain your meditation practice to your kids. So I'm excited for you to talk to her. She's the author of several books now, Hot Mess to Mindful Mom, Get the Most Out of Motherhood, and the new book, One Minute to Zen, which you'll hear about. So This is a great, great conversation. Before we dive in, I just want to encourage you to subscribe to the podcast and support the podcast. This is a super cool community. The Mindful Mama Tribe has been growing. You can support the podcast by sharing it with your friends, telling other people about it, sharing it on Facebook, you know, just forwarding it. Do you know you can forward it in your phone to your friends? It's super easy. And then of course, leaving a review is a great way to share and to support the podcast because it helps other people hear the podcast, Mindful Mama podcast in that sort of Apple podcast algorithm. So if you could take a minute out of your day to do that, that makes a huge big difference to me. So thank you. Thank you so much. When you do that, it makes a big, big difference. But yeah, I don't want to keep you too long. Let's dive right into this episode. Allie, thank you so much for coming on the Mindful Mama podcast. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to talk to you. And as we talked about, we have a lot of things in common, tea, running, meditating, (laughs) Absolutely. It's so so fun. (laughs) So you're the author of three books, and I'm excited to talk to you about your your new book, One Minute to Zen. And we're going to talk about some ways that, dear listener, that you can find your Zen. But first, you talk about kind of being, you talk about being a hot mess. And a lot of us can relate to that terminology of feeling like a hot mess. But Take us on the journey from from being a hot mess to then becoming a meditation teacher and a tea drinker and a runner and all those things. Okay, perfect. (laughs) So it's funny, people hear the title of my first book, Hot Mess to Mindful Mom, and ask me, without a doubt, were you really a hot mess? And I say, I was, but I didn't know how much until I wasn't anymore, if that makes sense. When you're in the hot mess phase, you don't necessarily 
see all of it. But then when you start to change, you look back and you're like, whoa, I used to live like that. So I think when I was a younger mom, a newer mom, I had this idea in my head that being last on my list, being a martyr, meant I was proving my love to my family and meant I was doing things right, that I was showing my family how much I love them because I was last. But the problem arose that when I was doing this, I was giving my family an exhausted, overwhelmed, depleted version of myself, one that yelled more and maybe cried a little more and, you know, just just wasn't my best self. And then when I started practicing self-care, just a few minutes a day, I started with just a few minutes of meditation, things began to really change. And I began to feel more confident and more compassionate toward myself and others and less reactive and more responsive and more connected to my intuition and less anxious and just so much better. I worked on some sleeping issues and I decided meditation was the best thing that ever happened to me as a mom, as a person. And even in just those few minutes a day, consistently, things really started to change and transform. And then my family began to get a more present, you know, joyful, fun version of mom, which everyone loved and which I loved being, you know, I felt so different. And I was like, well, just a few minutes a day has made such a difference in my life. I'm not different than anyone else. I'm just doing, you know, spending a few minutes on myself every day consistently. This has been the best process ever, I have to teach other people how to do this. I'm a really big share. So whether I love a book or a lip gloss or meditation, I want to tell everybody about it. So I said, I can't keep this to myself. And I decided I wanted to be a meditation teacher. So I did a year long program and literally things just took off from there. And then I started writing and speaking and all, you know, just kind of snowballed. And I just found my purpose and my passion as well as being a mom and a wife and all of those wonderful things, teaching meditation, writing, speaking, all of that. Just, it's amazing how it's taken off. And I think it's because it was the right thing for me. It just took a little while to find it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's so funny because the listener who has been along on this journey for a while can, you know, knows that, that all of the, so many things you described, describe my experience exactly with meditation. Like, oh my gosh, this, this isn't that weird. This isn't that hard. I'm just doing it. And it's made a huge, profound impact on my life, like an enormously profound impact on my life. It's kind of like, I kind of look at it like sometimes like, like a weird, like brain hack, you know, that like, (laughs) it's like, whoa, who knew you just sit still, focus on your, the present moment, focus on your breathing and lo and behold, all these amazing benefits can unfold for you. And it's not just me, it's for almost universally, like these benefits are available for anyone who can just simply breathe. And when I started I mean, I would have loved to have a teacher like I teach people because I had no idea what I was doing. I was so green. I didn't even know there were benefits of meditation. I didn't know anything. But all I knew was for eight minutes, nobody was talking to me. I wasn't doing a chore. (laughs) I I think it was the first time I was ever quiet. You know, I wasn't on the phone, you know, Facebook, all of that stuff. I was just with myself. And I had never experienced that. And it became so addicting because it felt so good. And if you're going to be addicted to anything in your life, meditation is a pretty good option. So totally, totally. Like I'm making like the me too gesture on this whole thing. You know, listener, just picture that. (laughs) So you were in this like mommy martyr place. How did you have the conversation with your family to say, I need more time? And was there any pushback on that? Because sometimes what happens, what I see with, with my clients and the people who go through the mindful parenting course is that there's sometimes this, this pushback of I'm changing the dynamic and I'm, I'm talking about what my needs are and I'm kind of asserting my needs now and that can change the dynamic in the family. So did you have any kind of pushback against, you know, you um, kind of taking that time and uh, that's a ask, great question. What you needed? Yeah. That's a great question. My husband was always, is always incredibly supportive of anything I do. And according to him, over the years, the things I want to do have gotten weirder and weirder. (laughs) So, oh my God, we could get really woo-woo. But um, he's always been incredibly supportive. Anything that made me happy and made me feel better, he's a fan of. So I never had any pushback from him. And then my kids were four and six when I started meditating. 
Mm-hmm. And I remember how I explained it to them. And I've written about this I'm in my second book, Get the Most Out of Motherhood, because people are always asking me, how do I explain meditation to my kids? How do I get my kids to meditate? So this is a topic I have definitely covered. And what I told my kids was, mommy needs a few minutes every day to be quiet so I can be a better mommy. And they were like, oh, okay. I was like, because I'll be a better mommy all day long if I just get a few minutes to be quiet. And they were like, they were old enough to get it. If they're younger, two years old, you basically need to organize a spouse or an older sibling or someone that's going to watch your younger ones for a couple minutes because they obviously can't grasp this. But my kids did grasp it. And what I told them was, you're always welcome to be near me but you can't talk to me unless it's an emergency. Because when I first started meditating, they would interrupt me every five seconds if they were awake. And I said, you know, if someone's bleeding, if someone threw up, if there's a really, really, really big problem, you can interrupt me. But otherwise, you may not talk to me. It's only a few minutes. You can wait to change the channel on the TV. You can wait for whatever it is. It's just a couple minutes. But you're allowed to be near me. I never excommunicated my kids from my practice. What I was doing was great. We want our kids to understand self-care. So modeling is the best thing we can do for that. So I said, if you want to lay down next to me, or you even want to put your head in my lap, I don't mind, or you want to read a book near me, or just be quiet in here, you can be near me. You just can't talk to me. And there were mornings that they would come in and just sit with me and lay on the floor and have some quiet time for themselves, read a book. And I truly didn't care if they put their head in my lap. They could be with me. They just couldn't talk to me. And they, they, they got it. They got it. That's cool. That's cool. So I love that exactly what to say to your kids. And so when you carved out this time for your practice, what does that look like for you? And I know that the, you know, those details are, are really important to help the listener who may be wanting to do this envision this. Like, what does that look like to you? Because for you, because we get these images of like, you know, a beautiful woman holding her fingers together, sitting cross-legged on a beach and super blissed out. But the reality is that one can meditate in a lazy boy uh, in your basement. So So, meditation for the real world looks like um, when I first started meditating, I don't know why I thought this was a good idea. I sat on the edge of my tub. Okay. Like, I don't know why I picked that. And my routine has evolved. But when I first started meditating, which was my first act of, you know, true self-care like this, I set my alarm 10 minutes earlier than I needed to get up normally. And I meditated for, I started with eight minutes and we can talk about times. I've started people with less. I've started people with one minute. That's what my book is all about. So we can talk about that. But I started with eight. So I didn't have a whole big to do. I just spent eight minutes sitting on the edge of my tub and breathing and being quiet. And then it graduated to my closet. I have a lot of clients, a lot of people that meditate in their closet because it feels like a little nice cocoon. So for about two more years, I meditated in my closet every morning. And then when I began teaching, I turned the front room of my house, I call it the Zen Den, and it's my teaching space where I teach in Houston. And so now I go down there in the mornings. Unless I'm super, super, super tired, I might sit up in the morning and prop myself up against my headboard and my pillows and stay in bed to meditate every once in a while. But normally I go down to the Zen Den. And now I like to have 45 minutes to an hour downstairs by myself before everybody gets up. But that has evolved over years and years. Mm -hmm. So I don't want anyone to think that that's what you have to do to have successful self-care practice. You can wake up and meditate for five minutes, eight minutes, whatever you want. As long as you do it consistently, you're going to see the benefit and feel the benefit of it. Yeah. You're building that muscle of uh, non-reactivity, which is beautiful. That's such a hilarious image of you on the tub. I'm just like, yeah, I like put a towel <laughs> under me and then a towel like behind my, like I, I set up this whole thing with the towels and I'm like, why didn't I just move? Like I look back and I'm like, why did I do that for a year? <laughs> yeah. And so probably as you teach now that meditation and practicing mindfulness, practicing being present to dive into the time is, is a dose dependent activity, right? So that the more you know, Allie's meditating for longer now because the more meditation mindfulness practice we get, the more we feel those benefits, but that 
one minute a day is is powerful and makes a big difference. And Allie, can you talk to talk to the listener about why even that one minute, if it if it's you know this dose dependent activity, is is powerful? Yes. Well, so much is about what you can do, not what you can't do. And so I have clients that will say, you know, I can't meditate for 20 minutes every day. And I'm like, well, can you meditate for one? Can you meditate for two? What can you do? Focus on that. So if you tell yourself, I can breathe at a traffic light, or I can take one extra minute in the shower, you know, and just breathe, then you're doing, it adds up. You're doing more than you think you're doing. You're getting in the habit. You're making this a priority in your life. You are bringing more mindfulness and meditation into each day. So I'm all about what can you do. I'm also all about meeting people where they are. I'm not trying to flip anyone's life upside down and take them from zero to a hundred in one fell swoop. I'm like little baby steps Little baby actions lead to big results. So where do you feel comfortable starting? You feel comfortable starting with a minute at a time? Great. That's where we're going to start. And then when that feels routine, maybe, just maybe, my prayer is that and my hope is that someone will wonder what two minutes feels like and three. And then all of a sudden they're meditating for 10 minutes every day. So baby steps can take you where you want to go if you're consistent with them. And it also is when we do even one minute, we are activating our parasympathetic nervous system. We're calming our body down. We're focusing on one thing at a time. It takes three nice, long, deep breaths to begin to put yourself into a more calm space to start releasing anxiety, to calm your body down. So one minute really can have a huge impact in your day. If you're feeling overwhelmed or stressed or anxious or frustrated, you know, there's positive ways to tackle it those feelings and those emotions quickly. So I always like to say, stress is never going to stop coming. Life is never going to stop throwing things at you. But how quickly can you recover from them? How quickly can you get back to center? And that's what a one-minute meditation will do. We'll get you back to center anytime you feel stressed or overwhelmed or anxious quickly. And that's the thing. So then we're not in a tailspin for two hours. You know, after a minute or two, we're really back to a better place, back to ourselves. So how quickly can you recover? And that's what one minute meditations will help you do. Mm, Yes. Yes. Dear listener, listen to Allie. Look at that. It's such a beautiful way to explain it. And so I just want to define terms for anyone who may not understand, but the, the parasympathetic nervous system is the opposite of the sympathetic nervous system. And the sympathetic nervous system is our fight, flight, or freeze reactivity that, that, ups our our blood pressure and gets our heart racing and our muscles tense. And the parasympathetic nervous system is what is sometimes called the rest and relax response. Um, And that is what you described, you know, allowing ourselves to take things down a notch, reduce, reduce that stress response. So before we dive into some of the ways that the listener can find those Zen, diving into some of those ways, let's just look at quickly what is stress doing to us? I mean, we heard for your story, and that sounds, I think, so familiar to so many people about how stress was making you irritable and cranky and not so fun to be around with your kids. But what else is what else is stress doing to us? Oh, boy. I don't think people, I certainly didn't until I started learning about it, understanding how harmful stress is to your body. Because what happens is when we feel stress, we're meant to feel stress every once in a blue moon, okay? So we have this stress response that when we have an experience that, you know, sets us off. So in the old, you know, everyone has heard this example, the tiger chasing you thousands of years ago. Okay. Well, the tiger didn't chase people every day. That happened every once in a while. So that was really stressful. And then, you know, people had time to settle back down until something felt stressful again. And the thing is though, in this day and age, in 2018, soon to be 2019, Life is so much more stress. We're bombarded with things all day long. So we might be feeling stress or recovering from stress all day. And when we feel stress, it takes four hours for our body to recover. So when we feel stress, hormones, 
and chemicals are being pumped throughout our body that are meant to keep us safe in times of danger, like when that tiger is chasing you or when you get caught off on the freeway every once in a while and you have to respond quickly. You need your sharp, your senses to be sharpened. You need more blood going to your extremities and more oxygen pumping throughout your body so you can react quickly. But when this happens day in and day out, all day long, when we're bombarded with stress, everything from family obligations to financial burdens to work stress and everything in between, even getting a soccer practice on time, driving in traffic, all of these things, then we have these chemicals and these hormones like cortisol and adrenaline pumping throughout our bodies more than they're meant to. We don't have enough time to recover. And this can lead to toxicity in our body. And this toxicity can have long-term effects, things like heart disease, insomnia, headaches, depression, anxiety, even forms of cancer, things we really, really don't want. And doctors claim that stress can be responsible for up to 90% of illness and disease. So lowering our stress in our bodies, getting into the rest and digest the parasympathetic nervous system as much as possible is going to stop these hormones and these chemicals from pumping throughout our body all the time. And we're going to be having our body operate optimally, sorry, that's a little bit of a tongue twister, Mm -hmm. instead of feeling stressed all the time. So stress can wreak havoc on our bodies and we need to constantly be calming ourselves down. And the more you meditate, the more you begin to discern what really is a stressful situation or what isn't. Like we become stressed so quickly, but we're able to say, wait a minute, is this something that I really need to be stressed about? Or can I breathe and just think, thoughtfully how I'm going to proceed in this situation. So I feel like that was a lot of information. No, no, I think that was great. That was a wonderful explanation. Yeah. And your and meditation helps us look at and see whether it's just kind of the stories that we're thinking that are causing this or whether it is real, right? Like, or, you know, have that objectivity, right? That sense Absolutely. of like and- increasing our awareness of, of what's really going on. Sorry, and getting us back into the present moment yes. because a lot of times, you know, if if we're feeling stressed or anxious, then our attention is typically in the future. And if we're mm-hmm. feeling sad or a little bit mildly depressed, our attention is typically in the past. But if we're feeling calm and at ease, our attention is typically in the present moment. So as we gain awareness around this, we can catch ourselves based on how we're feeling and say, wait a minute, I'm feeling stressed or I'm feeling sad. I'm in the past or I'm in the future. Let me bring myself back to the present moment. And your breath and a one-minute meditation is the best way to do that because your breath doesn't happen in the past and your breath doesn't happen in the future. Your breath only happens in the present moment. So if you're concentrating on your breath, then you are present. So you can get yourself out of those stories really quickly, even with just knowing that. That is life-changing. Yes, yes. Amen, sister. And and the and and like 99.9% of the time in the present moment everything's fine. You know? <laughs> yes. Like, well, you know 90% of what we worry about doesn't actually happen. So I, think about all the stress that we put on our bodies based on something I call it future tripping, like something that isn't even going to happen most likely. Yes. Yes, it's so true. I know. Yeah, and then the more we the more we know that and start to feel that, the more we realize like, oh, whenever I am really fully in the present moment, I just feel happy and relaxed and just feels good. So then we start to practice a little bit more. Up exactly. it to 5 minutes or 6 minutes a day. So The other um, thing too is you can do these 1 minute meditations throughout the day mm-hmm. in line at the grocery store, at a traffic light. You know, they add up. So You can create a mindful pause throughout your day. I like to tell people, instead of reaching for your phone constantly, you can reach for your breath and do something worthwhile in that minute, you know, instead of always being on the phone. So you just, the more you practice, the more natural it becomes. And I always tell people, if you want to use one minute meditations, when you feel stressed, overwhelmed, anxious, all those things, you have to practice them when you feel calm and when you feel good because you can't do anything in stress that you haven't actually practiced when you're calm. Yes, yes, which is why, yeah, we can't. We need to practice before we get to the point of like yelling at freaking our kids out. and irritable and freaking out yes. at everybody else and just won't you all be quiet so I can feel better. <laughs> exactly. 
And the more your kids see you doing yeah. this, the more they're going to catch on. And, you know, I'll never forget the time my older son was stressed and I didn't even say anything. And he just started breathing. And I'm like, wow, he does pay attention because he's seen me do it like 500 times. And then the funniest was after a basketball game that got a little heated at the end, he guts in the car and he's, you know, going off and he unzips his backpack, takes out a essential oil roller that I didn't even know he had in there, puts it on, takes a deep breath and goes, oh, I feel so much better. You know, ah. They do catch on. They do pay attention. So. That's great. Yeah. I mean, modeling is the best form of parenting. Kids are really not as great at doing what we do, but or doing what we say, but great, great yes. at doing what we do. So yes. good at that. I always tell people they pay so much more attention to what we do than what we say. So if yeah. you, if they don't see you doing it, they're not going to listen, you yeah. know? Breathe. I'm interrupting the podcast to invite you to imagine listening to the ocean and feeling the warm breeze on your face. Imagine seeing little monkeys and smelling the fragrance of a tropical orchid while looking out at a vista of islands and endless ocean. This will be your reality when you join me for the Mindful Mama Costa Rica Retreat next April. We'll be staying in a luxurious private estate, which has a view to the beach over the rainforest canopy from every room, as well as from the yoga porch and the infinity pool. Join me and other Mindful Mamas with each day designed to have a perfect balance of time for yoga, mindfulness, discussion, and free and open time so you can either make it adventurous, go hiking, learn to surf, kayak through the mangroves, go zip lining or more, or make it relaxing. Instead of adventures, relax poolside or wander down to the beach. We'll start each day with meditation and all levels yoga on the yoga porch. Every afternoon we'll come together for guided relaxation and coaching and discussion with me. Locally sourced foods will be served at breakfast and dinner by our talented in-house chef. If you want to get away from everything and take the break that I know you deserve, join me. We have limited spots available, so now is the time to reserve at mindfulmamamentor.com slash Costa Rica or email me at hunter at mindfulmamamentor.com. That's mindfulmamamentor.com slash Costa Rica, or email me at hunter at mindfulmamamentor.com. I can't wait for you to join me there. Breathe. Yeah, we have to live what we want our kids to learn. So let's dive into some of those ways that we can bring some one minute meditations into our lives that are going to reduce that, that stress. Okay. Well, there's 35, so it's hard <laughs> to pick what I want to do. Pick some. Okay. I'm just going to pick some. Flip randomly. <laughs> okay. So one thing that I think is super powerful is finding your anchor point. So you can take a deep breath and you can notice if you feel it the strongest coming in and out of your nostrils or you feel your rib cage expanding and contracting, or you feel your belly rising and falling. And at different times and different days, you will feel it stronger in different places. So just taking a breath and noticing where you notice your breath the strongest, and then focusing on that for a minute. Mm. So it's super easy and super powerful. So that's so, finding your anchor point. So pausing and just... Mm -hmm. Just taking a breath and anxiety. noticing... Mm -hmm. And then letting that anchor you into the present moment. And so, yeah. And then taking a few breaths to feel that anchor point and just exactly. kind of, it, 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 I can almost visualize it, right? Like an anchor, like something that is holding you, grounding you to the earth, right? Like just holding you in, in a place where you're not flying off in crazy directions. Absolutely. And, love that. and that's a great one. You can even do that at a traffic light. You can do that, you know, as a business meeting is starting, you know, you can talk to your kids about doing that as a teacher is passing out a test. You know, there's, there's no wrong time. So it's really, really helpful. Okay. Another one that I love, and I think is a game changer for people is gratitude made easy. So, you know, 
gratitude is so important. What we focus on gets bigger. We want to live at a, you know, a higher, more positive vibration. Gratitude helps us do that. And I was like, I wanted a way for my, for myself and my clients to practice gratitude that didn't feel like a whole nother to do and another journal and like, you know, all of that stuff. I wanted it to be a little more automatic, but I'm a big reminder person. I have so much going on in my life that if I don't see a note that says something or an email, I'm not going to remember. So what I did was I took a little index card and I just wrote gratitude on it and I taped it on my bathroom mirror right where my toothbrush is. And then every time I brushed my teeth, I would look at the note and I would see the word gratitude and I'd be standing there brushing my teeth. And so I would think of a few things that I was grateful for. And this became the way that I began and ended my days. So I kind of bookend my days with gratitude with this practice. And it felt so good and so easy and so in the moment that then I started teaching it to other people. Everybody loves it. You can even put... Um, a gratitude note on your kids' bathroom mirrors. They don't have to admit to you that they're doing it, <laughs> you know, and, um, and, and everybody just feels so good beginning and ending the day with gratitude. So that's another really simple one. Mm, I love that. I, um, I asked my daughters as they're going to bed, I, you know, I asked them, what are you, you know, what are three things you're grateful for? Or what are a couple things you're grateful for today? And you can just see how it just feels good, you know? So now yes. they, they expect that. And it's just something that feels good to remember. And it's, it's pulling our brain out of that natural negativity bias and, and practicing, practicing how we want to feel, right? Practicing exactly. to lean into what's great. Love it. Awesome. I'll tell you my favorite thing I do with my kids in the morning. We call it morning mindfulness. Our whole carpool loves it. So in the morning on the way to school, they take, depending on how old they are, three to five nice deep belly breaths and breathing in and out of their nose, but really focusing on their belly rising and falling. Then they think of three things they're grateful for in their head. And then everyone goes around and take tur takes turns saying why today is going to be great. And it is the cutest thing when they are like, today's going to be great because I'm going to rock my test or I'm excited for my basketball game or it's Friday or whatever they say. Everyone is getting out of the car feeling so positive and their heart is full and their body is calm from the breathing. And it just is the perfect way to start the day. So listeners might want to incorporate that too. I totally want to try that, but I am worried that my kind of like my 11 year old daughter who will, you know, tends to be a little bit grumpy and cynical in the morning. is going to <laughs> Well, my kids are 11 and 13 and they still love it. The 13 year old still loves it. And even if she is a little snarky about it, don't let that stop you. Keep going because she might push back a little bit and then you will be surprised. She will catch on. And so she can even, you can even say, if you don't want to do it, you don't have to, you can do it with your younger. And she's probably doing it in her head and she's just at that age that she doesn't want to admit it to you. <laughs> so Maybe. still do it. Maybe. I'm totally going to write this down on my sticky note and put this in the car and try it tomorrow morning because mom's courting hey. like that. And you know, but you know, what's funny Bob's talking about gratitude at night now. So, you know, exactly. So we're, like, <laughs> we're going to start our day too. And what's funny is the kids in our carpool, we have two other boys in our carpool that mindfulness is not a part of their home. I mean, they're wonderful from wonderful families, but their parents don't meditate. If this stuff isn't talked about at home, they love it so much. If there happens to be a morning that I, it slips my mind, they're like, Mrs. Katz, we didn't do morning mindfulness. Kids love it because it feels good. So, you know, I think, you know, people might not realize how much it means to their kids until they give it a go. Mm, let's try it. Listener, let's try it. We'll do it together. Awesome. Okay. So another <laughs> one, because you and I are both tea junkies. Um, <laughs> I love that. So I talk about drinking your way to calm. So this is a way to practice making just a simple activity feel more mindful. So if you sit with a hot mug of tea or a hot mug of coffee, it's bringing your senses into it. Just taking one minute, holding the cup, feeling the warmth, smelling the aromas, slowly taking a sip. How does it feel in your mouth? How does it taste? Really using your senses to dive into that moment. When you are focused on your five senses, you are not thinking about anything else. So you are really, really focusing. You are really present and in the moment. And it can just be the way you take your first sips of that tea or that coffee. If you don't have time to sit leisurely drinking, you know, because you're busy getting ready for work, have to hop in the shower. 
getting the kids off to school, whatever it is, just the first sip or two, you can do it really mindfully and bring your senses into it. I, I like that a lot because I practice in uh, Buddhist tradition and they often talk about mindful eating and we go on retreat and we do like, you know, full on meals with mind that are silent and things like that. But I have a, a habit of reading the paper in the morning. And so like, I just enjoy that, you know, <laughs> this is part yeah. of the big part of life that I enjoy. And so we, we have a rule in our house that you're allowed to read at the table in the morning for breakfast. That's, that's okay. But the, so a whole meal of forgoing my morning paper sounds like kind of sad to me. And like a lot of like, um, uh, a lot of uh, like, I'll have some FOMO there, but just those first couple breaths, just really being there for that, that is really doable for me. And I love that. And, that's and awesome. it's, it's cool. It is really like, you know, it is actually, you call this your book one minute to Zen, but it actually is quite a, a literally a Zen tradition in the Zen, my, the Zen Buddhist teacher, Thich Nhat Hanh, talks about drinking your tea mindfully and talks about real, you know, looking at your tea and seeing in your tea, you know, a cloud, right? Because your tea, the water in your, your tea was once a cloud and kind of wow, seeing that so inter beautiful. interconnection, right? That's so beautiful, right? I love that. So, so it really is um, a very Zen, Zen thing to do. I love that. And that can also be, you know, drinking a whole cup of tea like that may feel overwhelming or eating mm -hmm. a whole meal super mindfully with no distractions might not feel doable to someone. So when I talk about meeting people where they are or what can you do. So if you say, I can't drink my whole mug like that, but I can take three sips like that, or I can't eat my entire meal like that, but I can take my first three bites like that. And mm -hmm. so what can you do? Always thinking in terms of that versus no, 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 that feels too hard. Or maybe it's through your first bite or your first sip. Whatever works for you. This is a judgment-free process. Everybody is on their own journey starting from where they are. So it's really about finding what works for you, taking ownership of these tiny little baby steps, these small changes that, as I, as I said before, lead to really big results. I'm totally in. I'm all in, Allie. Love it. Cool. Um, Okay, so you want me to give you one more? Yeah, yeah, let's do one more. Okay, so this is a really good one, especially for the holidays, or this is going to be the new year. So for the new year time, for really any time, single nostril breathing is a really great tool to have in your back pocket because if you ever need energy, think about that three o'clock slump, you know, when you might reach for another coffee in the afternoon. When you need more energy... You want to use your left thumb to close off your left nostril and breathe in and out of the right nostril only. This is the sun side of your body, the more energetic male, you know, sun energy. And this is how you would breathe for a minute or three or whatever you have if you need more energy. Okay, more focus. So if you're about to do a big project and you really, really want to be able to focus or you're feeling a little tired, breathe in and out of your right nostril only. If you need to chill and you're feeling overwhelmed or anxious or stressed, you want to use your right thumb to cover your right nostril and only breathe in and out of the left side, which is the more feminine energy, the moon side of our body. This is going to calm you down. So it's just really a cool thing to have in your toolbox. Right side, energy and focus, left side, calming. All right, listener, let's try this right now. Whatever you need more, energy or calm, just pick a side. So if you're, if you're going for energy, close off your left side. If you're going for calm, close off your right side. And I'm going to do it with you. Let's, let's just take a few breaths like that. If you find your mind wandering, really just mm. focus on your breath. I love that. It's already very calming. Cool. Right? Cool. It's awesome. I did the calming one. <laughs> I figured. Okay. But it's great because that's a tool for whichever you need. So it's just a really, really good one to have on hand. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. And so uh, thank you so much for these, these uh, five one-minute pauses throughout the day. I love these. So find your anchor point, feel it in your body. Gratitude may be easy. Just write gratitude on it. That's pretty easy. I think we can all do that. Morning mindfulness for kids. I've already written that down on a bright orange post-it note, so I'm ready for the car. 
<laughs> and drinking your way to calm, drinking tea, tea people. <laughs> and then uh, that single nostril breathing. That's cool. And, you know, you also in the book talk about things like affirmations. You talk about different ways to just to really start to feel good. And I, and I just wonder if, and you say, you know, thinking about this idea of, of feeling in chapter four, you talk about this idea of feeling lack or feeling abundance and that this is, this is a choice. So was this something that you were always the, this idea of feeling good and just prioritizing yourself feeling good? Like I'm here to enjoy life is a, an actually an affirmation I say every morning, right? So was this something that you were always tuned into or or did this shift at some point? It was this, yeah. I mean, I would say I've always been a positive person. Um, I had a lot of trauma, you know, in the teenage years and growing up wasn't easy. Um, putting myself through college, all sorts of things felt really stressful. But I was very resilient and always stayed very positive. But I think some of it was a defense mechanism. <laughs> I don't think I really dealt with a lot of the things at that point. So in the you know past few years, there's been a lot of processing going on um, where I've really worked through a lot of things. And I became very aware of conscious language and how everything we say has a vibration and everything we think has a vibration, you know? And so really focusing on feeling more abundant. And abundance doesn't just have to do with money. Abundance has to do with time, with joy, with love. Really focusing on that and letting that become bigger in my life. And um, when it came to processing and dealing with some of the really hard things, what really helped me and helped me to feel more abundant around them was the lessons, understanding you know, why this may have happened, what, what I was supposed to learn, how I was supposed to grow, everything that happens, whether it's comfortable, uncomfortable, you know, good experience, bad experience, ultimately there's something there leading us toward being the better version of ourselves. So what is there to learn? And I, I stopped resenting some of the experiences and actually became grateful for how much I learned and how mm -hmm. much I was able to grow. And I don't think it really gets more abundant than that you know, in terms of, of dealing with things and, and not sweeping things under the rug, really processing and then understanding there was so much growth there. And I need to be grateful for that. I want to be grateful for that. I'm so great. I'm so glad you mentioned this, Allie, because sometimes, you know, people can look at thing, the, some of the things you're teaching, right? Like um, finding these mindful pauses and this gratitude throughout the day and think sometimes we get this idea that, because other people are suffering, we can't feel good. And that we we shouldn't feel good when there's suffering in the world, when there's terrible things that happen all around the world all the time. And that and somehow it's somehow like like I don't I don't know if we even articulate this, but it's almost like like it's somehow selfish oh, yeah. to feel feel good in those moments. But but what you're saying is like this feeling good, like kind of what I'm seeing say, hearing you say behind what you're saying here is that this feeling good and these practices that ground you and keep you level and bring that equanimity into your life and, and balance out those other things that bring stress into your life. Th those are the things that give you the, the, the strength and the energy and the wherewithal, the clarity to be able to process the challenges. Yes, that have absolutely. Happened. Until I was still and quiet, I wasn't able to process. I was just on a hamster wheel, probably mostly trying to ignore things. <laughs> so, you know, that quiet time each day allowed me to get to know myself in a different way, to process things, to feel things, to notice things about myself and almost get to know myself in a whole new way. I, one, I don't remember where I wrote this, but I equated it to dating. Like I felt like I was dating myself. Like I had a first mm -hmm. date with myself and then I was really getting to know myself until I truly felt that I loved myself and was in a relationship with myself in a whole different way because of my practices. Mm -hmm. And there was a whole different level of acceptance and love and, and, it felt so good. I never had that before. And when we do that, and when you do that, we can just show up for every single other person in our life 
in a incredibly more powerful way, in a much more present way, and just see them and hear them and have that acceptance for them, which is really what a gift. I mean, it's the most powerful gift Absolutely. we can give. I mean, it's amazing. Sorry. Absolutely. No, I was going to say the only thing I'd like to clarify mm -hmm. for the listeners is that I think there can be a misconception that once you meditate or once you have these mm -hmm. mindfulness practices, you're never going to feel stress mm -hmm. again. And something's wrong with you if you do, or you're doing it wrong. You know, I hear people say to me, oh, you're a meditation teacher. Your life must be so zen. And I'm like, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. My <laughs> life is not zen. Um, but I, you know, I recover so quickly from things yeah. and, and that's my definition of success. I used to think finding balance that everyone talks about balance was like a place I was going to get to and stay at. But what I realized was it's a constant recalibration. You know, mm -hmm. we're feeling really good. Then life, you know, throw something at us. We dip, we use a tool to come back. We feel really good. Same thing happens. We get better at recovering at rocking those waves. So it doesn't mean we're dead inside. It doesn't mean we don't have emotion. It doesn't mean we don't ever feel anger or we don't ever feel frustration or anxiety or we're never upset with someone else. It's not that. It's to me, how quickly can you recover and come back to center? So, you know, it doesn't mean anything's wrong with you if you meditate and you still feel angry sometimes. It's, it's, you don't want to hide from emotion. You want mm -hmm. to deal with emotion and process emotion so that you can recover from it. So I, I really, I think there can be a misconception out there that you're supposed to just be in, you know, meditation doesn't mean you're in la-la land all day. Would you agree with that? Yes, yes. Everything you said, absolutely. I mean, I've been practicing meditation now for over, let's see, how old am I? 13 years. So it's, it's absolutely all of those things and it's recovering faster and it's having that clarity to say, oh, I'm in a crappy place right now and this is what it is. And the sooner I accept that and let, let myself feel, let myself be in that, let myself feel it, let myself actually really feel it in my body. Like, what am I literally feeling in my body? And say yes to this feeling, then it can go away. Then it, yeah. I can recover much more quickly and easily. But absolutely, like all the feelings are still there. You're going to feel the right. entire rainbow. And sometimes, and it's, it's, it's definitely, it, sometimes it, it's funny because you can be on this. I mean, for me personally, I feel like, you know, I can be on this path and, and a part of my brain wants to say, oh, I shouldn't feel this way because I haven't, you know, because I have been meditating for over a decade, you know, because I, I do teach other people this, right? Like part of me says, oh, I, I shouldn't feel this way, but that's, you know, we all have that voice. So, so if right. you have that, you know, if you listener have this, that voice in your head, I've got it too. It's just, it's just kind of coming back anchoring, right? Like just what you talked about, Ali, anchoring in, well, you know, what is, what is real and what is here and now in this moment. And yeah. And letting go of the judgment, yes. you know, yes. obviously, you know, mindfulness is moment to moment awareness without judgment. So yeah. accepting and not judging, I think is obviously the key. Yeah. Yeah. So this is beautiful. I really appreciate the, you know, sharing these, sharing these ways to find a little more peace and calm in our days. And, and I think that the way you share is really approachable and you make it really understandable and you really do meet people where they are. So I want to thank you for doing that work that you're doing and, and putting and being part of the solution, putting these, this great stuff out in the world, Allie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me and for all the work you're doing. And I thank the listeners for, you know, taking time out of their busy lives to, to listen about these tools. And I invite everyone to grab a copy of One Minute to Zen because we talked about five different ways to deal with stress quickly, but there's 30 more in the book. And there's a lot more things I talk about, about this mindful spending experiment I did and having an intuition journal and what that did for me. So there's a lot of personal, really cool, interesting stories in there about some other things too. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. And, and Allie, I have to ask you before you go, your name is Allie Katz. Like, did you, like, is this, did you marry into the cat's name I, or did, did you like, did you, okay. So you didn't, you didn't undergo a barrage of torturous uh, teasing when you were a kid. No, but I do now. I mean, like whenever <laughs> I'm on with customer service and they're like, what, give me your full name. And I'm like, Allie Katz. And in my mind, I'm like, wait for it, wait for it. Here it comes. And they're like, oh, 
That's so funny. So I'm used to it now, but no, I married into it. But it was funny. My very first interview I ever did for my very first book, the first question they asked me was, how did you pick your pen name? (laughs) Well, I married him. (laughs) I married my pen name. Awesome. (laughs) Thank you so much, Allie. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Wow, I feel like Allie is like my doppelganger living in Houston. (laughs) And we both like tea. So, so cool. I love how she, I love those one minute meditations that she shared. They're super cool. I'm totally going to be trying that morning mindfulness with my girls. I love that she told us exactly how to explain meditation to our kids. So, so cool. So if you liked this episode, please do share it. Share it with your friends, your family, share it on social media. It makes a big, big difference. And leaving a review on iTunes makes a huge difference. If you would like to spend some time with me and learn some of these practices and techniques that we talked about today and much, much more, join the Raising Good Humans VIP retreat in Costa Rica. And you can find out more about that at Mindful Mama Mentor slash Costa Rica. So yeah, those are some great ways to connect, to to jump over out of the headphones and meet in person. I love that idea. Otherwise, I'm just wishing you a beautiful week. I'm wishing you some, some peace, some zen, some presence in your life. It really makes all the difference in the world to you, to your family, to the, our overall quality of life. And like, what else do we have, right? But this one amazing, precious gift of this life. So let's use these practices to become more present for this life. I'm wishing that for you and me and everyone. Yeah, absolutely. So wishing you a beautiful week. Let me know if you enjoyed this episode and and I will be back in your ears next week, my friend. Namaste. Thank you to DJ Taz Rashid for this wonderful song, Inspiration Drive. Go ahead and download his album, Live in Love, on Apple Music or on Spotify or wherever you listen to music. 